What's up, I'm Ujemma, and as of this past month, I've been working as a full-time software engineer, which is really crazy for me to think about. Within the last year, I've learned a ton there is to know about being a software engineer. So in this video, I wanna share with you the five things that I've learned within this past year. Just for a little bit of context, I graduated school back in 2019 with a computer science degree, and then the current job that I have right now that I've been working at for the past year has been my first and only full-time software engineering position. So everything that I've learned has been from this one place that I'm currently at right now. So the first lesson that I learned from this past year is to know how and when to ask for context. One of the most common pieces of advice that's given to people who want to become a software engineer is to ask as many questions as possible. And this couldn't be more true. The more questions you ask, the more information you obtain. And I think one lesson that I've learned from this past year is asking questions are great, but I think one of the most helpful questions that I've been asking a lot are contextual questions. Questions that allow me to get more context around a new feature that I'm implementing or maybe more historical knowledge on the decisions that have been made throughout the company's lifespan. I think asking for context helps inform the decisions that you have to make on the day to day and it helps you better understand why decisions are made within your organization, your department, or even at your company. So the best way for me to gain context is to ask people as many questions as possible in person during technical or non-technical conversations. If they throw out a term or if they throw out a decision that's been made, just ask why that term is being used or why that decision was being made. Another great place to ask for context is to ask questions in technical documentation that might be a little confusing, or you can ask questions or leave comments on RFCs, which are just documents that detail out a large scale plan for implementing a new type of architecture. So if there's again, a word or a decision or some practice that's being used across the company or found within that doc, it's just a great opportunity for you to ask the question of why that decision was made or why we're we using something or why we're doing something in a certain way. Another great place that I like to ask for context is in people's PRs. When people explain what their PR is supposed to do and then you see the code that implements that new feature, it can be kind of confusing to connect the pieces of, sure, this is how you implement something and this is the new feature that we're getting out of it, but we have to answer the question of why. Is this solving a bug? Is this a completely new feature that is a part of a new initiative within the roadmap or something else? So asking as many questions within a PR is a great place to have a nice back and forth, which is clearly documented. So other people who end up going back to that PR can see your conversations with that person. The second lesson that I've learned is try to make friends instead of mentors. When I got my first internship back in college, I remember meeting a lot of people within the tech community in my company and outside of my company. And when I would ask them about like, how do I further my career as like, right now as an intern, but also in the future as a full-time software engineer. And one of the most common pieces of advice that I got was to try to find a mentor, like someone who could help you exceed as a software engineer as a whole. In my mind, I thought a mentor was that one person who was supposed to help me with everything in my life concerning software engineering. Like I thought they were supposed to help me become a better programmer. And I thought that they were supposed to help me get better at negotiating and talking about feedback and progressing in the career ladder as a software engineer and just everything around the concept. So that was a very daunting task, right? I thought that I had to find that one right person. And so for like two years in college, I felt like everyone was gaining their mentors or finding mentors while I was just like making friends and just like general peers who I enjoyed spending tons of time with, but I felt like I didn't have that one person that I could look up to. But what I've learned in this past year is that some of the most beneficial relationships that have helped me become a better technical programmer or someone who has a better sense of how to navigate her career ladder has come from just general friendships. And I found that being able to become friends with people without the expectations of getting something out of them forms longer lasting and more genuine relationships. And what I found also on top of that is that people usually are really knowledgeable in one area where you're not so knowledgeable and vice versa. So it's only natural when you become really close friends and you're comfortable talking to each other about a variety of different topics. When it comes to asking someone about their expertise, they're happy to tell you about it. And they're also very happy to ask you questions and you're more likely to be able to give them that information. So what I realized is instead of trying to find one or two mentors who are supposed to guide your life and label that person only as a mentor, I found just like making friends and just talking to people and asking a lot of questions has given me a lot more insight and a lot more genuine insight on what I need to do or what I should be doing to become a better software engineer. The third lesson that I've learned is that it's okay to say I don't know. 
I think one of the biggest difference between a junior developer and a more senior developer is the fact that one is probably a little bit more comfortable saying I don't know. And one thing that I've noticed about people saying I don't know is that if that person is typically helpful, we're going to follow up that I don't know with something that's actionable. For example, let's say that I ask a software engineer if they can help me with this problem that I'm dealing with and then they say I don't know. Instead of them saying like, I don't know, good luck, hope you can figure it out yourself, they can turn around and say, I don't know, but I can do some research or I can look into it for you or with you so we can both get a better understanding of what's going on. I feel like whenever someone admits that they don't know something, it's a great sense of confidence and control over what they do know. Like they're not going to try to sell you some sort of version of themselves where they're all knowing about the product you guys are both working on. Another great example is if you ask the software engineer again, like, hey, how do I integrate this new service? It's okay for them to say, I don't know. And I think a great follow up would be like I personally don't know but hey you can like reach out to these three different people they probably have a better idea of what's going on in that system. I feel like having the ability to redirect someone to the right person is probably as helpful as giving that person the answer just because you are continually unblocking that person like you're aiding in the process of making sure that that software engineer is not blocked with the original problem. So what I've learned is that it's okay to say I don't know as long as like I'm following it up with some action item of committing to do more research or pointing them in a more promising direction. The fourth lesson that I've learned is to document everything. When I mean document everything, I mean literally document as much as possible. The more documentation that you generate, the more historical knowledge and context you're providing for the company, for new hires and people who are joining onto your team or working with your team. And with that in mind, documentation just doesn't have to be like technical docs. You don't have to just write tech docs for the new API that you created, the new service that you just deployed, or for a new team that you just joined. Documentation can be for anything. Like for example, let's say that you open up a PR that's addressing a ticket and you implement everything according to the ticket, but then one person suggests that, hey, maybe you should include this in your PR. So instead of adding that extra suggestion in your current PR, which is going to blow up the scope of it and the ticket, what you can do is just create a new ticket and then attach that ticket to your PR. So everyone knows that you created a new ticket. And what you're doing by creating a ticket is that you're documenting the discussion that happened. Instead of you addressing that suggestion and placing it in your current PR, you addressed it by creating a ticket and saying, hey, we're going to address this ticket in a future sprint or in a future quarter. Another popular form of documentation is self-documentation, where you write out what you've done in the past day or the past week. And self-documenting is super powerful because it allows you to get a greater sense of the progress that you've made as a software engineer in the past three, six, nine, 12 months, or even beyond. These also come in handy when you want to ask for a promotion or take on more complex projects because you have information that is detailing exactly what you've been doing every single week or every single day and how you've been growing as a software engineer who is deserving of that promotion or that more technical project. The fifth and final lesson that I've learned is that work-life balance has to be established by you and not by the company. I feel like a lot of tech companies are trying to establish a better sense of work-life balance, which is great. And the team that I joined at my current job establishes a great sense of work-life balance. There's no expectations of working late or putting so much extra time into a specific project. But what I've learned from this past year is that even if a company does establish a great sense of work-life balance, it's up to me to also establish a sense of work-life balance. I have to be the one to be able to cut off my work whenever I'm supposed to be done working and just go home, leave it for the next day, and not not worry about it. And I feel like having that ability of cutting off your work when you're supposed to be done with work is especially more difficult since a lot of software engineers are working from home right now. For me personally, I think this is probably one of the most important lessons that I've learned because it's such a slippery slope. So let's say that a company has no expectations of you working overtime, but you personally are cool with working overtime, maybe an extra hour to two hours. So you consistently working overtime could lead to people's perception of your standard amount of work to be that overtime work, which isn't standard. So people can turn around and start placing maybe unexpected expectations on you because you're so used to working overtime. And I just feel like this pattern can lead to a lot of problems like getting burnt out. So the best way for me to establish a great sense of work-life balance is to know how much work I can take on and know how much work I can complete within my regular nine to five without doing overtime. But yeah, these have been like the five lessons that I've learned in this past year. 
there's a ton more things that I've learned from this past year, but I feel like these lessons have been the most reoccurring and the most constant. But that's it for this video and the five lessons that I've learned from this past year. If you enjoyed what you saw, you can drop a like and subscribe to the channel for more JavaScript and software engineering content like this. I'm also on Twitter where I talk about JavaScript and a whole variety of topics. You can feel free to send me a DM and we can have a chat. Also, if there's any type of software engineering JavaScript content you want me to cover in the future, please let me know down in the comment section below. But that's it for this video. I will see you on the next one.